Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Thuru Muniraj, one of the interventional endoscopists. Thank you, James, Ron, and Jill, for uh, uh, letting me uh, moderate this session and giving a talk. So my topic is differential diagnosis of pancreatic masses, the rule outs. I don't have any disclosures relevant. So next 15 minutes, I'll be talking about what are the US features you look uh, when you look for a pancreatic cancer and uh, what are the subtle clues in EUS will help you to suspect a pancreatic cancer? And we'll segue into what are the mimics of pancreatic cancer and what challenges we have in differentiating uh, cancer versus other lesions. Uh, let's start with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Pancreatic cancer has some typical features in EUS. It's a, we all know it's a hypervascular tumor, so it's pretty hyperechoic that it's a little bit darker when compared to the surrounding parenchyma and very infiltrative, it's not a well-circumscribed lesion, it's poorly marginated, and you often see a common bile duct or a pancreatic duct dilation, and there is a tendency to encase vessels. This is a good example, you can see an uh, image here, the 54-year-old woman present with abdominal pain, and you can see a hyperechoic lesion in the head of pancreas, and the second, uh, <coughs> here you can see the pancreas duct is so dilated, and you can see atrophic distal parenchyma. And this patient comes to the EUS, and EUS, uh, you try to focus where the duct is uh, abruptly cut off. This is the bile duct here, and the pancreas duct is also uh, blocked. You can see the pancreas duct here in the body. It's dilated. And you try to focus on the site where there's a transition, and you find the hypochoic mass where uh, the margins are pretty poor. It's not well circumscribed. And you can also see it's invading into the portal vein and uh, you stick a needle there and you get a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So most often in EUS and as well as, of course, CT2, we'll have a typical features of pancreatic mass to diagnose. But we need to take into account certain signs which will uh, help us to lead the diagnosis, especially when the tumor is very small or subtle, these telltale signs. So when I do a EUS, I'll be looking for a pancreatic duct dilation, common duct dilation, sometimes even both, that is even more ominous. And if pancreatic duct is dilated, then you look for abrupt cutoff or a transition point. And uh, most often, these patients have distal pancreatic atrophy. So this is a good example. You can see this patient, 79-year-old, presented with uh, obstructive jaundice. And the CAT scan, you can see a dilated pancreas duct here, atrophic pancreas. And there is a transition point here, but CT could not actually see the actual mass. And you do a EUS, same thing. See the distal bile duct is so dilated, obstructed. And here is the port, uh, pancreas duct is also dilated. And you just torque and spin around the scope to find where you lose the pancreas duct, where there is abrupt cutoff. And you find this small hypochoic area. Stick a needle, you get a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. This is another example interesting. This patient uh, presents with acute pancreatitis, first time in the lifetime. No gallstone, no alcohol, but you see pancreas duct is dilated right here. And the head of pancreas is a lot of inflammation going on there, but you don't see an actual mass. And whenever I see a dilated duct like this, even if you don't see a tumor, it says there's something going on there. You've got to take, like, unless it's tumor, unless proven otherwise. So we did a EUS on this patient. Same, you try to find the abrupt cutoff point or transition point and locate a small area of hypoechoic area right here. It's one centimeter. And stick a needle, it comes as cancer. And this EUS image, you can see this iota and uh, celiac is coming out. This is a celiac lymph node, but it's pretty small. It's not specific. And usually the pancreatic cancer uh, rarely uh, causes a bulky, large lymphadenopathy. So when I do EUS, uh, there are some signs you know, if I see them, it makes me doubt if it's really a pancreatic cancer, if it's a standard pancreatic cancer or something else. What if there is a mass in the head of pancreas, but you don't see any ductal dilation at all? Usually in cancer, you see that. Or what if there is no distal atrophy? There's a bulk, bulky mass sitting in the head, but there's no atrophy. Or if there's a mass surrounding the vasculature, but not causing any narrowing, which is very unusual for pancreatic cancer. And also lymphadenopathy. I just showed you bulky, huge lymphadenopathy is usually unusual uh, in pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So there's a list of uh, differential we can come up with. Not every single mass we see is adenocarcinoma, though that's the main focus to rule out my pancreatic cancer. Autoimmune pancreatitis, 
We didn't know much about a couple of decades back, but we are learning a lot now. Brew pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, sometimes so hard to diagnose in the US because of calcifications, and chronic pancreatitis have dilation of pancreas duct, so it could be very challenging to diagnose them. Or it could be just a fat in the head of pancreas, may look a little bit different, uh, hypochoic sometimes too, so, and or it could be a normal gland, like ventral dorsal differentiation could confuse that it's a head, head mass. Or sometimes you see an annular pancreas that can look like a mass, and likewise lymphomas, neuroendocrine tumors, splenules, or even serous cyst can look solid sometimes, or metastasis, patients live longer these days, so you can see a metastasis to pancreas, though it's rare. So top in the list, autoimmune pancreatitis, as I told you, it's a relatively rare disease, but at least we're seeing more now, or at least we are cognizant of this condition more now. So this uh, presents like a diffuse enlargement of the gland, uniform enlargement with loss of lobular ecotexture, so the gland looks like a banana or sausage shape. There are two distinct types, type one and type two. Type one, interestingly, that's IgG4 related, presents with obstructed jaundice, and they have a focal mass sometimes in the head. And that obstructed jaundice from the stricture from the biliary duct, so you can see that how confusing it may be in a focal mass, biliary stricture, jaundice, looks like a pancreatic cancer, right? But if you are lucky, you may see a halo around the pancreas, which uh, sometimes you see that favors AAP. But the clue is the non-dilated pancreas duct. The pancreas duct does not get dilated in uh, autoimmune pancreatitis. So in this patient who presented with the jaundice, you can see a CAT scan called 3.5 centimeter mass in the head of pancreas. And uh, you can see this is distal pancreas. You can't even find the pancreas duct. It's not dilated. The patient comes for ERCP because he's deeply ectric. You can see the fluoro image here. There is a tight distal biliary stricture here. This is the proximal bile duct. This is a stricture here. And he got stented, improved jaundice. Then we do EUS, this is the EUS. You see head of pancreas here. There is no focal mass. But you can see the whole head is a little bit hypochoic with a lot of white strands, that's inflammatory strands in between. And you find, try to find hard the pancreas duct. You can't find it, it's so small and it's not dilated. Then you stick a core biopsy needle if you suspect pancreatitis. Then a pathologist calls it as lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate with a lot of IgG4 cells. Then we go back and check serum IgG4, it's pretty high. Then we put the patient on steroids, look at this bile duct structure, it almost melts away, almost gone. And patient is doing really well now on steroids, and we, but, but we are carefully watching him. This is another example, a young guy who presents with acute pancreatitis, not jaundice. And you can see the cat skin here, like a bulky head here, and the distal pancreas. Again, pancreas duct is not dilated, but almost getting to that sausage shape I told you the lobularity is gone. And you do EUS, again, no focal mass, uniformly hypochoic, some white strands in between, pancreas duct is not dilated. See how nicely the duct coursing through this lesion. It's not a pancreatic cancer. You stick a needle in, you're gonna get probably neutrophilic infiltrates and some typical granulocyte epithelial lesion, which is uh, typical for AAP type two. They respond beautifully for steroids and they don't relapse, pretty rare, relapses are pretty rare too. Another interesting condition in this category, GRU pancreatitis. A lot of inflammation in the GRU. The GRU is uh, right here, pancreatic or duodenal GRU between the pancreas head, duodenum and the bile duct. Inflammation, soft tissue deposition, and can cause bile duct stricture and pancreas duct stricture, just like chronic pancreatitis. So it could be really confusing, this condition. And uh, this you know, illustration, you can see that there is some soft tissue hypochoic right here, and pancreas duct is dilated. It looks like a cancer right there, right? And this is a, with the oral contrast. You can see the contrast is trickling down the duodenum. Some cystic change close to the duodenum, outside the pancreas. So, but sometimes it's the same with the EUS too, that you're finding a cyst here. It's very difficult to diagnose. You know, even if you stick a needle in here, and if you get a EUS, a FNA negative for cancer, how can you be so sure that you know, it's not a cancer 100%? Sometimes these patients end up we're having a whipple just because um, we can't exclude cancer. Lymphoma is another interesting differential. Primary lymphomas are very rare in pancreas. But when you see a lymphoma in the pancreas, it's usually maybe a, some non orgins lymphoma or B cell lymphoma coming to the pancreas. But lymphomas are very focal, bulky mass, have a predilection to head, and the margins are very poor. And uh, 
you know, very interestingly, there, it does nothing to the duct. The pancreas duct does not get obstructed, and there is no vascular narrowing. And another interesting thing is it can infiltrate in all the directions, anterior, posterior, medial, lateral. It has no regard to anatomic boundaries. Whereas pancreatic cancer, we know that it preferentially goes posterior retroperitoneal. That's why you see celiac trunk involvement, common hepatic involvement, SMA involvement. Rarely it goes to gastric, colic, ligaments, mesentery. And you obviously are going to find a lot of surrounding lymphadenopathy with lymphoma. This is a nice example. Uh, this patient had a bulky mass right here in the head and neck. And you can see that a lot of uh, <clears throat> large necrotic nodes along this, along this supimesentric vein. And see the pancreas here. You can look hard, but there's no pancreatic duct dilation. And uh, stick a needle in, we got non urgent lymphoma, large B cell. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are a good differential for um, pancreatic cancer in many situations. We know that it could be functional or non-functional. Functional tumors secrete hormones, so patients present with hypoglycemia, diarrhea, or multiple ulcers, so they get medical attention sooner, so the lesions are smaller. Whereas non-functional tumors are you know, asymptomatic, when they get to a point like symptomatic, it's pretty large, causing mass effect. So that lead, you know, these lesions present with cystic changes, necrosis, and pretty aggressive, mostly non-functional or mal malignant. So when I do a EUS, if it's a neuroendocrine tumor, what do I get? Usually these lesions are very well circumscribed, unlike pancreatic cancer, and very vascular, unlike pancreatic cancer, which is hypervascular. And uh, it may be cystic and large if it's necrotic, and uh, you can see a thick rim uh, in these lesions, and rarely does obstruct pancreatic duct. It can because of mass effect if it gets larger, but rare. And also pancreatic atrophy it could be uncommon. But can give rise to large lymph nodes, unlike pancreatic cancer. And occasionally you can see a calcification too, but you never see a calcification in pancreatic cancer. If you see a calcification, probably 99% is not a cancer. It can invade the vasculature. Pancreatic cancer usually encases around the vessels and cause narrowing, it can go into it. And liver meds, if you see the liver meds, if you get arterial uh, CAT scan or a contrast CT, you can see that it's all hypervascular, just similar to uh, the neuronecrine tumor. So this is an example. This patient uh, had high PSA and had a prostate cancer screening CAT scan. And you can see a small uh, circumscribed lesion right here and was referred to us. See the pancreas, no ductal dilation. Do we EUS, this is the lesion right here, very well circumscribed. You can see here the shadow, a little bit solid. And this black is more liquid. It's a solid cystic lesion. And the pancreas duct is right here, very close to the lesion. It's hard to say whether it's going into the lesion or, or a different plane. It's all 2D, right? So hard to say. But we stick a needle. It's pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Patient got a whipple and doing well now. So this is another interesting patient been on surveillance for a cyst for many years. And now someone noticed a solid area inside the cyst and referred for EUS. You can see the well-circumscribed lesion here. Mostly, it looks mostly solid inside. And you throw a Doppler, it's vascular too. And there is no pancreas duct dilation. And again, FNA came back as neuroendocrine cells. As I told you, large pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors can cause mass effect and become symptomatic. And they can look aggressive, necrotic like this. This is a cystic place. It's a thick rim around. So this patient got uh, acute pancreatitis from uh, this pancreatic duct obstruction. You can see the PD is so dilated. And uh, then we did a EUS, FNA, which was uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine. But whenever you see a cystic uh, lesion like this, I ask myself, is this a neuroendocrine tumor? Because easily you can get uh, distracted that it could be just a pancreas cyst, like an IPMN or something. But the key here is the thick rim around the cyst, which is very typical for neuroendocrine tumors. And that too, if you throw a Doppler, if it's very vascular, then it says more about. Another interesting differential is intrapancreatic splenule. Most common site of splenule in the pancreas is the tail of pancreas, very close. And uh, you know it can mimic neuroendocrine tumor because it can look well circumscribed. And uh, if you see this uh, EUS, Harry did this EUS a couple of days back. You can see this lesion right here. The key is it will be identical to the spleen uh, echogenistic. You just talk the scope a little bit. You can look at the spleen. It will be identical. You don't have to stick a needle in. If you're really in doubt, ask for a sulfur colloid scan. That will give an answer. As I told you, metastasis to the pancreas, 
quite rare, but can happen. But mostly it's from uh, vascular lesions like renal cell carcinoma, uh, sometimes from melanoma lung and breast too. But it's hard to differentiate its primary versus metastasis by uh, imaging appearance wise. History is going to help us a lot, like history of nephrectomy and all this stuff. So this CAT scan and uh, EUS you have here is from our melanoma program. And this patient had a hypoechoic lesion here. You can see this is the pancreas rectus obstructed. And this is a meds from melanoma. I think I, that's all I have. And uh, thank you so much for your attention time.